you better say it out loud. Well, hello again, and welcome to today's dialogue, sponsored by the League of Revolutionaries for a New America and Hip Hop Congress on Beyond Elections, the Political Revolution Continues. I am Mackenzie Wilson. My pronouns are they, them. My work is in the grassroots abolition movements in California. I live in Sacramento and I've helped start organizations like Decarcerate Sacramento and the Sacramento Valley Tenants Union. I'd like to begin by introducing one of my co-moderators. Born and raised in Oakland, California, Dr. Kimberly King is a community college professor in, psycho in psychology and ethnic studies at Laney College in Oakland. She currently serves as a member of the National Council of the League of Revolutionaries for New America and is involved in organizing for housing as a human right. Kimberly has a history of public education, activism and organizing and served for many years on the executive board of her labor unions and is a founding member of the Laney chapter of the Poor People's Campaign and Black Minds Matter at Peralta, an abolitionist transformative justice group of students, staff and community members who work with the community and the Peralta School Board uh, tr of Trustees to eliminate armed police from campus security. From 2005 to 2016, Kimberly was producer and co-host of Beautiful Struggle, a political radio program on K um, KPFK 90.7 FM, the Pacifica station in Los Angeles. She currently serves on the editorial board of Rally, the political paper of the League of Revolutionaries for New America. Thanks, Mac, for that introduction, and I'm looking forward to a great discussion today. I'd like to introduce our third co-moderator, Kathy Van. Catherine Van began her activism with organizing against the Vietnam War at San Francisco State University in the 1960s. This led her to become a member of the League of Revolutionaries for a New America at its inception. Kathy now serves on the League's Peace and Social Justice Committee in Los Angeles and the National Basic Needs Electoral Committee. In 2002, she co-founded San Pedro Neighbors for Peace and Justice to promote anti-militarism and local justice campaigns in the LA South Bay, holding forums and weekly anti-war street vigils that continue to this day. This in turn led to youth work and the development of peace clubs in several high schools, including the summer peace camps held over the last 20 years. Great to be here with you, Kathy. Unmute, Kathy. Okay, I'm unmuted. Hi, all. You know, it takes time. I get my stuff together here. But thank you, Kimberly. Uh, we encourage you to put your pronouns into your profile as a participant. Uh, gender and sexual liberation is part of our work. And, um, you know, our work to have a free society. Um, of cis hero patriarchy, which is deeply intertwined with white supremacy and other forms of oppression. We also encourage all of you to post links in the chat to your campaigns, the struggles you're in, or important organizations you're a part of to allow us to be able to share in your work and your wisdom. I just wanna name some community agreements that we request that you observe in today's dialogue. Again, I've already said this one before, but everyone is muted in the beginning and must uh, unmute themselves in order to talk. We do hope that you do not interrupt our speakers. Um, and we hope that you can save your questions for uh, when we go and do our question and answers uh, part of the dialogue. We encourage you to put those questions, of course, in the chat during the presentation. Panelists will have a chance to discuss them, time permitting. We apologize in advance if there is not enough time to answer everyone's questions. There will be an opportunity to ask verbal questions during the question 
an intersection, but we request that if your internet connection is bad, it will interrupt the program. So please use the chat. Uh, Zoom adequate is for people to remain muted whenever not talking, to keep that noise floor down. And in the spirit of political unity, please listen and practice respect and kindness, including in the chat. Please do not miss pronoun participants and please make space for all voices. Uh, make space, take space is a great community agreement where if you're one who's always first to ask the question, first to make a statement, first to talk, take up a lot of room, pause and make space for those voices that historically have not been listened to before you. I believe we're gonna start dropping some links into the chat. Um, and while we do that, I'm gonna go ahead and, ooh, I just lost my camera, there we go. I'm gonna start with a land back commitment statement. Um, we're trying to move away from these land back acknowledgements, right? Where we acknowledge the land that we're on and are more trying to move forward into like a, a programmatic and a pragmatic expression of what the idea of land back means. So first we do, right? We want to acknowledge that we gather on, tra on the traditional land of indigenous people, past and present, and honor with gratitude the land itself and the people who have stewarded it throughout the generations. Before I continue, I want to invite folks in this space to drop the names of the tribes of whose land you are calling in from now. I'm here on the lands of Maidu, Miwok, Misenon, Patwin, and, and Wintu people. If you do not know the name of the nation on whose territory or treaty land you're coming in from, ask around. Look at a native land map. Go to an indigenous student center, a fellowship center, or a local band office. Those are always a good source of information and, and it can actually get you involved in your local land back movement. We want to acknowledge and recognize that the land is an expression of gratitude and to give appreciation to those whose territory we reside on as a way of honoring the indigenous people who have been living and working on this land from time immemorial. It is important to understand the long standing history that has brought us to reside on this land and to seek to understand our place within that history. We are living in the consequences of global colonization people and lands stolen, many languages, history, and cultures lost. Between their artificial borders and walls and their economical devastation, we have people who have, had, who have had to migrate and are even now finding themselves to be stateless. We live in a world where 99% of us are fighting for breadcrumbs, while the other 1% squanders the wealth that we have created for them. And as climate change worsens, we will see them use the stolen land that they have now turned into private and productive property and use it to hoard the resources that we need to survive. Well, no. Today, we make a commitment. We may not know exactly what land back looks like in the aftermath of such devastation, but today we make a commitment to push through the dyings of capitalism and white supremacy to liberate the means of production and give it to the working class. We commit to learning how to be better stewards of the land that we inhabit, and we commit to following the lead of who's come before us on these lands and learn from them on how to live together. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Mac. And now I'm going to introduce Jeannie Sullivan who's gonna say um, just a few words. Jeannie is a leader and he's involved. they are involved in the fight for housing as a human right and is currently a student. Welcome, Jeannie. Hi, everyone. Um, my internet's a little unstable, so hopefully I get through this. Um, so the, the league's mission, um, simply put, is to bring people together uh, to fight for collective liberation, like everyone on this call. And, you know, we are here to develop a strategy to create the cooperative society 
that distributes resources based on need. No one should be homeless, hungry, undereducated, gunned down, or incarcerated by representatives of their government just because we are poor. Um, yet the situation today um, that we find ourselves in and we uh, as the League emphasize the need for unity um, of our people's movements against the authoritarian attacks um, that we are experiencing in this moment um, on our class and the planet. Uh, the League makes the connection between the suffering, poverty, and inequality that people experience today and the social movements of our class and that fight for what we need and ultimately to provide a vision for the cooperative society uh, of abundance. And, you know, really the, the League is here to help develop the class consciousness that is necessary to achieve that vision. Um, but, you know, honestly, like it brings up the question of like, what even is class? Um, and the way that I think about it is class is a structural relationship between people um, that is really determined by like the control that some people have, few people have over the resources um, that all of society needs to reproduce itself. Um, so like this is like super clearly seen through the fact that like in the Bay Area where I live, um, there's over 160 billionaires um, that hold $1.3 trillion in wealth. Um, so this really clearly shows that poverty is a political decision, not some kind of individual failure or something like that. Um, but class isn't just like the quantity of wealth that a person has. Um, it's really just more like the fact of having any kind of control over like this this wealth that all of society produces. Um, and what this looks like in the real world is like people who receive income from like interest, dividends, rental income, uh, like trusts, things like that. Um, like those people can kind of be understood as like the, the ruling class. Um, and, you know, anybody who's uh, doesn't have access to um, kind of the, the social surplus, or the, the wealth that uh, society produces, um, that can be understood as, as what I call the dispossessed class, um, but a lot of people understand it as like the working class. Um, and so yeah, class is really understood as like a person's dispossession from the social surplus rather than like some kind of inclusion into like this like horrible capitalist system um and you know it's important to clarify that like class is not necessarily understood as like the only experience that impacts like a person's well-being um you know a variety of experiences like you know racialization gender oppression citizenship language education you know all of that impacts like our our well-being um, but the difference is that uh, class is like has an internal dynamic, you know, by the like ruling class oppressing, um, you know, what's traditionally understood as the working class. Um, whereas like there's nothing about being queer, you know, like, you know, me and like, you know, or being indigenous or being a woman, um, you know, that that determines like somehow the unequal position in society. You know, that kind of inequality is socially constructed, um, whereas class has that kind of internal dynamic. Um, so yeah, I hope this kind of helps clarify, you know, what class is and what we mean by class. Um, and, you know, ultimately, you know, what it means to be class conscious today is to recognize that the ruling class uh, uses its control over the wealth that all of society creates to divide people, divide the, you know, our class, and, you know, to ultimately have an outsized influence over politics to maintain power. You know, we saw this in this election, and, you know, really, 
we are here to like call people in and you know really say that like only united we can find liberation um and all forms of inequality um and the league is committed to that and we are you know really we would be happy to have you a part of the league thank you I'll pass it back yeah. Okay, I think it's my turn and I'm gonna go with it. Yeah, uh, I wanna briefly introduce um, our panelists. Um, if I could stop crying over the music we heard in the beginning. God, that was so moving. Jeez, maybe we could, okay, I'll go on with it. Um, but I want to ask each uh, panelist, you know, as, as they're introduced to, um, uh, after they're introduced to comment for three minutes on what these election results mean for them and the people they work with. And how do we protect our families and our communities under this new corporate dictatorship we are facing? So the first panelist I'd like to introduce is Melinda Levon. She's a mother midwife and community organizer in Kansas. She did the deep canvassing and campaign planning behind Vote No Kansas with her Lawrence DSA chapter and shared the recipe for mass movement with other states fighting abortion restrictions and constitutional amendments. Melinda was an author of DSA National's new priority campaign, Trans Rights and Bodily Autonomy. Kansas has plenty of billionaires funding parts of the authoritarian plan outlined in Project 2025. Extremists, including Christian nationalists, hold Republican supermajorities in both sides of the state legislature. This fall, she asked everyone to vote against fascists and their authoritarian friends every chance they get. Melinda, welcome. Hi, everyone. Um, I, uh, yeah, the music at the beginning was very moving. I had not heard that song by Nancy Sanchez about family separation and the kids in cages before. Um, so thanks for trying to make me cry. But I really, um, Mac, thanks for doing the land back statement. I think that uh, you know, as we look at colonialism in all of its uh, parts and what, what might be coming at the national and the, the statewide um, level. Yeah, Adam, we'll get the link to the Nancy song. Um, I, I think that going forward and what these elections say to me, the election results, because I will tell you that we've handed over our entire state here in Kansas to a complete fascist control even though we have a democratic governor for another uh, two years, she will be unable to do anything. We can no longer sustain any of her vetoes. We have also turned over our state board of education to a completely uh, far right uh, majority again for the first time in 20 years. Last time that happened in Kansas, they took um, evolution out of all of our curriculum and replaced it with um, creationism in our science courses. And it took us years to, to get out of that and get back um, to, to something else um, based in reality. Um, I think that uh, Jeannie, what they were saying about family or, you know, about, about separation and about the oligarchy dividing us, right? That's what they want. They want us to be mad at each other. Like right now they want us to point fingers at each other um, over election results that we're unhappy with. And um, I'm not gonna do it. I know some of my brothers and sisters in this country were lied to, right? Like they, they really believe some of the things that they uh, were told, like deportations will only affect criminals. Uh, that is absolutely not the reality. Like the kind of deportations that we are anticipating here in Kansas will not only you know, separate families in a very painful and, and even violent way. Uh, so instead of seeing abolishing ICE that we wanna see, we know they're gonna come to our communities. Uh, we know that restaurants will fail, farms will fail. We will lose food production that will impact the entire 
uh, continent. Um, and uh, immigrants are also a huge part of our healthcare infrastructure here, like they are in California. Um, and, you know, when you think about our, our uh, indigenous communities, I mean, what an ultimate disrespect to have this law enforcement accuse you and round you up in an immigrant raid. I mean, right, like, if, uh, come on, like, if you've been somewhere for thousands and thousands of years, because I know that's going to happen, right, like, that happens to a friend of mine, um, kind of on a regular basis. So I think I'm coming to the end of my three uh, minutes. Um, I, I think that going forward, our organizing has to be relationship based because that relationship is the most important thing. That is how we protect each other. It is how we connect. Um, and that is the biggest piece of mass mobilization. Um, and mass mobilization is difficult. It's um, sometimes ugly, um, right? Because we don't all agree on lots of different things, but we're asking people to stand on one line together on one issue at a time um, going forward. Uh, based on our, our relationships as we nurture those. Thank, Thank you. you. <laughs> Thank you, Melinda, uh, very much. Um, I'd like to now introduce John Janasco. Um, John, uh, is a person with lived experience of homelessness who is dedicated to helping ensure housing becomes a human right. When he was younger, he found himself in trouble that landed him in jail, which gave him time to get his GED and focus on himself. After leaving jail, he opened a catering business for 10 years. John moved back to the Bay Area to be closer to family and friends but the cost of living in the Bay Area pushed him into homelessness. John did what he could to survive until he found a community with Wood Street Commons community. He has been working with other homeless leaders to organize other people ever since. And so John, take it away. Well, thank you so much. Uh, hi, everyone. Um, I, I thought about this last night and, and, and really uh, I heard this uh, yesterday while on Instagram and I knew the elections, they, they were, it was, it was devastating for a lot of us to, to hear that Donald Trump became our president again. And I feel like we focus so much energy on the doom part of it. And we, it, it took away from maybe a positive that came out of it. I, I look at it now is that if Kamala would have got uh, elected into office, it, we a lot of people would have felt like we're OK. Everything's going to be great. We have somebody in office that's going to look out for the, the black and brown and, and poor people, the most vulnerable of our community. And, and it, it was like that when uh, 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 Obama, you know, we, we thought everything was going to be OK. And when we think everything is going to be okay, we we slack, we we loosen up a little bit, and we're not as aggressive like we should be. With Donald Trump becoming president, what that did for us, honestly, is that ensured that we are going to keep moving forward. That fire was going to be under us the whole time. It showed us that we had to continue on doing all this organizing. What we were doing before, going to be able to slack up. That there wasn't a savior. And in a society, you know, it's always, uh, uh, you know, advertised of a hero. And it sort of takes the, the stress uh, off of us to thinking that we aren't the ones that can do this, but we are the ones that to do this. So with uh, uh, the election turning out the way it, it did, I felt like that was somewhat a plus so that we can keep continue on organizing and, and building community because that's what they don't want from us. They don't want us to build community. They want us to, you know, depend on them for our food, which and our health and everything else, all the things that we should be in control of and which we really are in control of. We have to remember that, that we are in control of, of our destinies. And, and, and for Donald Trump to become uh, uh, president, I just feel like that was a plus because that's going to keep me moving forward. It's going to keep us moving forward and, and, and keep our eye on the prize of just being uh, in community and, and self-sufficient and, 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 you know, everything that we do, 
we're going to continue to keep doing it. Um, I feel like one of the, the main ways of uh, keeping the movement and, and, and building it too is also with the outreach that the Wood Street Commons does uh, every weekend and every day, basically. And that outreach is the way that we uh, uh, connect with the other unhoused people that are out there, like they connected with us, you know, when we were out there unhoused and stuff. And we have to remember, uh, I feel like all of us, to not forget about on the ground activities, on the ground uh, outreach, uh, and building the, the people that are going to come uh, behind us, you know, the same way that it happened with us. Uh, I don't know if that the beeping is my three minutes, but. Um, I think it, it, it's just very important that we don't forget. Um, and and I mean, no disrespect when I say this, you know, a lot of us, we're on these Zoom calls, you know, speaking of all this stuff, but I want everyone to remember, you know, the best way to build a movement is to be on the ground level and, and empowering other people that, you know, feel like that they don't have a place in this movement, that they can't help out, that they can't participate. We have to show them that there's a space for them to participate in their capacity in whatever they do. There's a place that they can help out and make this movement that much stronger. So I, I just say that and I, I, because I, I find myself on more Zooms and I, I feel like I, I, I'm not where I should be, but I am. But I also want to like, you know, bring that make that awareness to everyone else is like this. Don't forget about the people that are on the ground and, and they need motivation. They need to be able to see us. They need us to be out there, you know, touching and interacting with them uh, every day, you know. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you, John, for uh, being here and for sharing your important thoughts. And we look forward to continuing this discussion. And um, I think he, John did make a, uh, some very important points. And I just wanna ensure you that a lot of the people on this call are also working in the streets and working and organizing. And we better do both. We better work in the streets and we better talk to each other about strategy and tactics. And um, so I'm excited to be with people who are trying to do both. Um, I'd like to introduce Liz Gonzalez, one of our guests today. Liz Gonzalez is from East San Jose and the daughter of immigrant parents. Liz began organizing in high school around issues of racial justice and education with Californians for Justice. She is a co-founder of Silicon Valley Debug, a nationally recognized organizing and media collective working as a media editor and organizing around workers' rights, immigration issues against police violence and for housing justice issues. Liz was a leader of Silicon Valley Renters' Rights Coalition from 2015 to 2019 and the incorporator and current board president of South Bay Community Land Trust. Welcome Liz Gonzalez and we welcome you to share your thoughts for three minutes, thank you. Thank you so much, everyone. And thank you for um, inviting me back into this space as a panelist. It's always so uplifting, um, you know, in the moments when we're feeling low, um, this is exactly what we need to gather with folks um, to uplift each other. And it's what folks are doing everywhere. So it's really nice to see, you know, people turning to each other to figure out how do we support each other in our communities, um, exactly what we need to be doing all the time. Um, and I totally agree with what uh, the previous panelists have said, you know, the election results were, were a big defeat and um, locally and statewide here in California, like those results did make me shed a tear, not the presidential one, but um, I also have to acknowledge that we had a lot of folks participating in this election um, for the first time. You know, we've had a lot of our folks be able to come home from incarceration and be out um, talking with people about what some of these propositions would have done. And so we have to hold space for those real feelings um, and the real fear that folks feel uh, with the incoming presidency. And also 
keep doing what we've always done. Like the very next day, you know, like work didn't stop. We were in court. Uh, we were supporting families, uh, meeting with them. Um, and I think that gathering of folks is so important. Any group that you have, like even book clubs, clubs for moms, you know, wherever you can feel like you are receiving a bomb for your soul in these moments um, that works against all of that divisiveness that we are seeing being put on us. Like that's what we have to work against um, so that we can see each other as, as the same people, right? We are human beings with a heart, with a loving heart that maybe feel disconnected. And so it was easy to just mark something on a piece of paper that maybe folks felt like would not impact them, but the results really do impact all of us. And so we just have to keep doing what we've been doing before. And our faith has to be, you know, stronger than our fears. Our actions have to be maybe a little different because the tides have always been against us. And we've relied on each other really to make it by in our worst moments. And that's what we're going to have to keep doing now. Um, and we need like, the artists and the healers at this time, I think even more than ever, right? To remind us that we are full human beings um, that need some nurturing um, in this movement too for that part of ourselves. Um, so maybe more of that, right? More art, like it's always a wonderful um, experience here because you do pull in the art, the music, the poetry, the young people with their new energy. Um, and we can't let ourselves who've been doing this for a while get jaded. Maybe we have our little moments, uh, but we pick ourselves back up because the energy of the young people is so, so uplifting and their ideas are new. Um, so that's who I look to, right? And also to um, just bring them along a little bit more. Yeah. Thank you, Liz. Thank you so much. Thank you for bringing your energy, your uh, loving, fighting energy. Um, next, I'd like to introduce Rahman Jamal. Rahman is a community organizer and pioneering hip hop teaching artist who traverses the worlds of music, martial arts, education, acting and filmmaking in an effort to unite people through a collective global vision of creative sustainability through the grassroots network called Hip Hop Congress Inc. He began his organizing work at the turn of the millennia with what would become the largest grassroots nonprofit organization in hip hop history. Peaking at over 70 school and community chapters worldwide, the mission of Hip Hop Congress is to uplift culture through the creative development of artists and young people by investing in education, civic engagement, and equitable resource exchange. Rahman ran Hip Hop Congress's first college chapter at USC before becoming its West Coast Regional Director in 2004. Rahman Jamal turned the creative page for artists by writing California's first visual and performing arts and common core standard approved rap curriculum. He now works with a coalition of organizers as the current executive director of Hip Hop Congress Inc. Introducing the first state sponsored hip hop education grant program in the United States while he continues to teach and serve clients through his personal brand, Rap Force Academy, at, at his martial arts dojo, Afro Bushido Academy, SPC. Welcome, Rahman Jamal. Thank you so much. It's crazy to hear a bio read by someone so that speaks this so well. I'm sure you guys are listening to this as well. Um, but um, great to be here. Um, thank you, everybody, for, for taking the time to, to share in this dialogue. Um, John kind of took the took the words out of my mouth uh, in, in as far as the, the question um, and how the elections affected me. Um, being that I've been uh, on a path of really utilizing creativity and art as an artist to navigate uh, possibility, 
um, which is, you know, something that uh, is uh, uh, a tool that I think is underutilized and, and, and in large ways, um, we're not really taught how to do that. Um, so I'm always thinking, you know, where's the silver lining? What does this mean in the, in the ultimate chess game? And of course, you know, there's immediate, there's immediate concerns that we're going to have to address, but then there's also this, this long play. And we know that those who are, um, you know, in power uh, are able to do that through long term planning. And so, you know, I, I echo what what John was saying about, you know, this is this is a good thing in a way of now we, we can see our enemy. It's, it's, it's not it's not hidden. It's right there. And when you know your opponent's strategies, then you can strategize one level beyond. And what that looks like for me in, in the positions that I occupy, um, it goes all the way back to like um, what Melinda was saying about uh, relationships and how do we, now we have this kind of opportunity, um, you know, for those of you who have children, um, you know, I have, a, I have a, a young, I have a seven year old right now, um, but I also work in a, a, a family home daycare um, so we're, I'm dealing with really, really young kids. And some of the most important things that we can teach our young people at this, at those early stages of their life is relationship and how to um, navigate uh, their feelings, their emotions, and, and develop a sense of empathy that becomes, that becomes natural later on in life. And if you're not, if you're, if you're not raised in an environment or you don't have people in your life that are able to show you that type of love and that type of care, then you kind of end up growing into this sort of like doom and gloom kind of um, mentality. It can turn into that. And it's, you know, it, it, it trauma can do that to us. Um, so for me, what it, what it really forces me to really get even more specific and laser focused on is setting that example for every young person that uh, I, I come across in my life of like giving them um, you know, this, this sort of hope that like they, we do have the power. Um, we do have to ask ourselves, what can we still control? Because we know that now, you know, uh, a lot of the things that we're reliant on from an authority, from, you know, government authority, it's not a guarantee. So now we have to look to each other more on, okay, what are the things that you control? There's uh, something that's really, uh, you know, a model that we use in hip hop Congress called the Coopoly model. And it's sort of the, the collective, you know, a, 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 a juxtaposed to a monopoly model, but it's where, you know, every person kind of does a self-reflection on what are the resources and experience that they have access to and how can you turn that into a resource? How can you turn your experience, whether it's living on the street and understanding what is, what your needs are um, to, you know, dealing with, you know, uh, different, um, you know, government entities and, and things like that, you know, where are the gaps in our system that need to be filled? And so everybody's experience has value. And that's something that we discovered as, as artists who a lot of us in Hip Hop Congress are artist educators, um, is we, we, we can, are learning how to transfer our talents and our skills and our passions and our experiences, our struggles, our traumas, um, into teachable moments. And that is something that I think, you know, I, I think it, it is as far as, you know, the indigenous perspective, thinking seven generations ahead, um, we need to start doubling down on our young people and our youngest people, our babies, you know, we're talking about reproductive freedom, like this will give us a real, like almost a roadmap to how to prepare their thinking to be able to address. And really it starts with just self-esteem, right? strengthen their self-esteem so that when they do discover what's wrong with the, the world around them, they, they don't have that fear that's going to hold them back from making the necessary choices. So. Wow. Thank you, Roman. That was, that was it. Actually, all of y'all so far have just hit it so well. Um, and I'm excited to bring up our last panelist, um, Denny Park. Denny Park founded Skid Row's People's Market when he took over his family store in 2015. The store's motto is a safe space to heal. Danny is partnered with Creating Justice LA, a black led nonprofit serving Skid Row's residents and the unhoused to operate an affordable market with a mission of fostering social and economic health 
for the people of the neighborhood. For Park, this is about healing the historic tensions between the Korean American and Black communities in LA. Skid Row is predominantly Black, and the residents who live in a neighborhood should rightfully have some control over the institutions that serve the neighborhood, he says. Creative, um, sorry, Creating Justice LA founder, Pastor Stephen Q. Jim Marie, sorry if I butchered that, says he saw Park face historical racial tensions with honesty and flip the stereotypical narrative that, um, that all Korean Americans extract wealth without putting anything back. The Creating Justice LA's recent projects include community programming at the Peace and Healing Center in Skid Row and a worker-owned co-op called the Hip Hop Smoothie Shop. Park says this story can be a source of inspiration to others, and that would be a great privilege, he says. Welcome, Danny. Hey, thank you all. Um, thank you for the intro. Um, thank you, Kathy, Kimberly, Chris. Uh, those names I didn't mention, League of Revolutionary for New America, for, you know, helping to make all this possible. And, um, you know, I find myself in a lot of uh, just conversations these days. Uh, a couple weeks ago, I deleted all my social media apps. And then I find myself talking to people. Um, I mean, like in a really kind of soulful and um, cup filling way, you know? And so, um, you know, in response to the election that comes to mind because um, I mean, thinking of like for every action, there's an opposite and equal reaction, you know, something like that. Like it's also gonna be creative times, you know? There's a lot of fear and anxiety, um, but also, um, it it comes into question like how we metabolize uh, metabolize the fear and anxiety. You know that that is very much a creative process. So um, I don't have uh, you know much answers to um, or solutions to impart, but you know I'm I'm here with you all and um, with excitement and with an attitude of. Uh, I don't know, but let's find out. Um, and um, yeah, I'm inspired by every one of you all on a Saturday morning at 11 and 11. We're here from all over this country, inquisitive, trying to connect, um, just wanting to learn, you know? And so I think, yeah, it will be um, it's just a continuing, uh, continuous, um, Hopefully, you know, within, if I have the gift and opportunity, um, long life of um, ongoing learning. And um, to Raman, the, um, speaking to the hip hop part, I, I um, was reminded of uh, K rapper KRS-One, uh, Health, Wealth, Self. In that song, um, printed out the lyrics because I didn't want to say the lyrics wrong, but there's a part that goes, um, Everything in nature rules by kicking ass, what they telling me, but yo, you a friend to me. So I'm gonna tell you the secrets of MG, MC longe, longe, longevity. Um, secret one, if it ain't fun, you're done. Um, and about your career, uh, well, choose another one. So I think that's in, that speaks to me. Uh, I think that's very important um, that, um, you know, that, that fun element, that wonder, that sense of awe, and I want to keep cultivating that because, you know, it can be pretty brutal. And um, yeah, I guess I'll add one more thing. Um, there's a, there's a um, definition of the word emergence that I heard that I really liked. Um, it was shared by Adrienne Marie Brown. Um, and uh, she was referencing a person named Nick Obolensky, who studies leadership. Um, and they defined emergence as a, emergence is the way complex patterns arise from simple interactions, like, like giving, the, and giving the example of, of birds flapping their wings, producing murmurations. So I like that very much um, as far as, you know, all the st strategy and community organizing, the, this high level thinking and, and sometimes like 
what I found in even just hanging out in our Peace and Healing Center coffee shop. Things happen, you know, um, and we, we hang out. Um, it's not all work all the time, but we also hang out with each other, um, drink coffee with each other and kick back. And you, I, I find myself surprised to see what, what emerges. And so I guess that's, that's a source of um, inspiration and um, that sometimes I remind myself that, you know, go for a walk, sit under a tree, go talk to a squirrel or something too. <laughs> so thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Danny. And thank you to all of our panelists for giving their introductory comments. Um, so now we are going, we're going to ask a question of everybody, but, uh, and then after that, we're going to open it up to audience questions. So audience, uh, folks out there, please put your questions in the chat. Any questions that you have uh, for the panelists, if you have questions for specific panelists or for all of them in general, or uh, any specific ideas you want to share, um, we would like you to make your comment or your question pretty brief, and then we'll focus on the discussion. You can also raise your hand to ask a question um, if you have good internet uh, right now, so that if you feel you're going to be able to we're going to be able to hear you. Um, otherwise, please put your questions in the chat. And I'm going to turn it over to Kathy to ask the first question okay. for all of our panelists. I've unmuted myself. I'm getting ahead here. So the first question uh, we'd like to entertain is how do we use our mutual aid networks, Wood Street Commons, Skid Row People's Market, South Bay, CLT, et cetera, to help build the collective power we need to protect our people from Project 2025. How do we use that power to take back our country from the billionaires? I think you really would call on people. Yeah, didn't mean to interrupt, didn't mean to stop it. Go ahead. Great, Rahman, would you like to say something? Yeah, I, I, I'll give a real life example happening right now as we speak. So um, John, um, I'm right now uh, communicating with an artist who's dealing with homelessness right now in, uh, in Oakland. And um, this guy is one of the, uh, we met on a fluke. He's so talented. He's um, one of the original generation of turf dancers in Oakland extremely intelligent individual. Um, the guy is uh, just an incredible resource um, and an example, um, but he's dealing with this immediate, you know, he, 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 we were talking yesterday and he's like, I'm just trying to keep my, my head up so that I don't have to resort to, you know, something that he doesn't want to have to resort to, you know, on a survival level. Um, you know, uh, when I met him, um, so one, I want to connect him with you, John. Um, but uh, when when I met him, it was uh, uh, I was promoting for a um, a talent show that was uh, being co-sponsored by a gentleman, another artist, um, a battle rapper named Mad Ills, and he's out of Orlando. He had a uh, he had a uh, uh, he has a nonprofit called the Mommy Collective, M O M I. And there's a strategy that he's employing around um, art, artists who are facing homelessness. And one of the big strategies is how do you turn your creative assets into, or how do you turn your creativity into assets? And by understanding the process of getting works appraised, um, creating a story behind that work, when you, when you do something, for example, like the art behind me is a, a, a artist named Magic out of San Jose, um, but anybody that has that sort of on the visual arts level, for example, um, you know, can put a, if you put a story behind your art and you, you know, um, create some sort of narrative behind your art making and you take that to an appraiser, they put a value on it and then you wait a year and then it becomes a capital asset. Now, folks did that on a massive level. And this is what 
this nonprofit is kind of based on um, trying to do is to create a village of artists and to pool their their capital assets together, you know, through going through this process um, so that you can get bank loans, et cetera, things like that um, to to serve the community. Now, this idea was totally left field. I didn't even know that, you know, that that is a viable strategy. And so that's kind of speaks to, you know, what does mutual aid look like? It looks like individuals who are trying to solve the the problems that that are are close to them, that they're passionate about and sharing this information with networks is and sharing it far and wide. Um, just before this earlier today at 630 in the morning over here on the West Coast, um, I was on a, um, a panel right now. There's a retreat happening in New York that is uh, discussing the national standards for teaching hip hop music for music educators. Um, this is something that's been a really long, lo long process. It's like a 20 year process of even, you know, getting a hip hop culture to a point where uh, it can be studied in schools and it's youth culture. So it speaks directly to the experiences that young people are going through and it works. Um, but we have to go through the the uh, the uh, the process of getting it legitimized. Well, it's happening, and um, you know, so it's networks like that connecting to networks like this, and you know, sharing the solutions. I saw some somebody in the chat saying we can, we, we need to focus on the opportunities over the the woe is me, and that's absolutely true. We have to we have but we have to have the information to know what tools we have and what ideas we have together uh, collectively. Um, and so it's, it's, it's everybody just, you know, doing their work, finding the answers of, you know, what is, what is needed in their communities, locally, relationship wise, and, um, and just being really, you know, seeking the, the solutions from, from whatever you want to call uh, the universe, God, each other, you know, it's, we're, it's all of us. Um, and, and, and then taking that, that information and just sharing it, you know, and sharing it with, the, with people who have also two organizations where they can get that out to more and more people. So to me, that's what mutual aid looks like. It's a process. It's an organic process. And it's really beautiful when you see it start to work because it starts to look like, oh, synchronicities. I just had this conversation, just like, just like what just happened. So I'll, I'll leave it there. Melinda. Um, I'm kind of, ex one thing I am excited about uh, are the things that will come out of all of our arts communities, whether that be music, whether that be poetry, other writing, fictional stories, um, you know, visual arts, like, that. you know, historically, uh, you know, think about times where people were under very fascist rule and your communications are limited right, or monitored, et cetera. And one of the ways people would express ideas that they otherwise could not safely express were through the arts, um, whether that's, you know, through fictional stories with a lot of metaphors or, um, you know, uh, more um, abstract images um, that had um, clear meanings, right, to the people that, that knew what it was expressing. Um, the uh, so I that is one thing I'm excited about is to see the the artists express themselves and see communities um find find ways to express uh what is what is happening to them as Thank we you. go forward. And I think it's really sweet that Rockman, you've talked about kids and working with children. I have four kids, two are older and two are uh, teenagers. And um, those conversations have been really hard, right? Like the kids grilled me about what's gonna happen to Gaza, what's gonna happen here, what's gonna happen there? What about people that don't have papers? Like explaining the election results to my children was harder than facing, you know, the 30,000 people I serve in my county or whatever. Like that, that, that was the hardest conversation for me was helping them understand, um, you know, they you know, things are going to change, and they're actually going to change at the state level where I live faster, um, uh, faster than at the national level. Like one good thing is that whatever happens in DC kind of happens at a slower pace and timeline, 
then how quickly regulations or rules or new statutes can happen and take effect at the state level. Um, so I think it's important that we keep looking at, you know, who holds what power. Uh, you know, we talk about collective power, but if we think very pragmatically, like your county can only change certain regulations, your state can only affect certain regulations, that kind of thing. Um, so I think that kind of power mapping skills and sharing those with young people uh, is really important for their civic education and, and their participation as, as full people. Okay, great. Is there any other, uh, would any of the other panelists like to add to that? Liz? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, while we do that and we could, you know, start working on that local level now on policies and making sure we don't um, lose the protections that we already have. Um, like the whole work of the community land trust is to pull housing out of the market. And so it just makes me think like we have to pull our energy out of like the institutions that have harmed us that aren't really doing us any good. Like how do we pull our time and energy resources and money out of those things because it takes so much um, and then we don't have the time and energy to be building up communities that could sustain themselves, right? To um, have those deep relationships where we can trust each other, where folks aren't like, I cannot miss one day of work because I won't have this income. Like, how do we supplement that person's income and figure out ways that we are taking care of each other to eventually, you know, not rely on all these institutions or the government um, that really doesn't have our, our best interest um, at heart. Thank you. Okay. Okay, we're gonna move on to starting to um, answer some, unless somebody else had a comment. And if panelists wanna say anything at any point, uh, please do just raise your hand or jump in. Did you wanna add something, John? Sure, um, yeah, I <laughs> just sitting here thinking about, you know, the the building of, of, of unity. And I'm I, I'm I'm so tunnel vision because I, I in a good way because it, it it's it's really simple and I my model is, is the model is off of Wood Street Commons and, and just you know how that really worked so well for us and, and that that was the opportunity of everyone has something to offer was presented to me when I was out there and and honestly uh in you know getting high and I I I didn't want to just be high I want to be able to use that at that time gave me to do something positive and it showed me that even in the worst conditions you can be a positive role model you can be positive and and with all the advocates coming in and 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 seeing the potential within i guess me at that moment uh, as a leader as someone that has something to offer i just I, I i want to do the same thing we should make sure that we do the same thing when it comes to the unhoused out there because those are the ones that are a are, are part of the movement and don't even really know it yet because they don't know where they fit in fit in it's about opening the opportunities for them and showing that there is tons of opportunity for them to be a part of something more than you know just that existence network building how we're how getting connected with the artists down in LA this is exactly how we uh build with you know cross uh um uh, resources crossing all our resources and building that network up a uh, resource sharing basically not hoarding like everyone else does and sharing everything this this conversations that we're having right now is, is so powerful to me uh, you know, after speaking the first time, I had a few tears because I can feel like, you know, it all resonating. And what's so powerful about it is that we all have some sort of experience and we all in different ways. And we speak, uh, you know, differently when we are talking about how we uh, are, are participating. But the bottom line is we all want the same results at the end of the day. And it's great because we can all take this from each other, like this works, that works. You know, an educational education and awareness is what the League of Revolutionaries, uh, Kimberly, uh, uh, 
And Ethel and, and everyone that's, uh, that, you know, has been at these uh, uh, informational sharing opportunities have, uh, uh, you guys have really helped me on, on, on that education, on that, the, the I wasn't too in tune with and sort of scared of. And I just want, I really want to make sure I said thank you to the League of Revolutionaries for allowing me to be, uh, I guess, you know, a part of all this and, and valuing what I have to say. And I think that's a very big one last thing uh, that's very important is making sure that people are know know that they're valued, and that's how you build all of this. When they're when people feel valued and 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 feel like they have a piece of something, an ownership to it, they show up, they keep coming back. So I just wanted to say that. Thank you guys. Right on, and thank you, John, for all of your amazing work in the community and and everything that that we're all doing together. Um, I want to combine two questions from the chat and uh, bring this to our panelists. Um, why do you think that some left and revolutionary organizations pushed for voting for Harris? And now that the results are here, how can we help our new comrades who gained a new awakening? Once you see the truth of the class war, you can't unsee it. Uh, the, the person who asked the question said, my brother is angry and says the world is ruined for his son. I think his son will do well, but what about my brother? Yeah. So I'd like to open up. I'll, I'll share some thoughts. Great, Danny. Um, What, you know, for uh, quite some time, I've been very, uh, I think like many people, allured and attracted um, by the notion, uh, concept of the revolutionary, revolutionary ideals and um, maybe because I'm a cisgender man, I just love Che Guevara, all this, you know, like um, the concept of um, the revolutionary and it looks like this. Um, and it fits into the revolutionaries look like this and fits into this box and that's what, and um, like, I guess, yeah, kind of just meditating on like revolution um, I mean, even in our worlds, we see people, I mean, um, the canceling, canceling people, I mean, if, obviously, if you're doing much harm, you know, there's a, those are, those happen. But, um, you know, when I, um, this is, this is uh, something I shared that I've been inspired by a couple of years ago. Um, uh, my friends and I, we started a men's nonviolent communication learning group. Uh, I think it was the beginning of 2022, I forget, but it was the beginning of the year and there were like two mass shootings. They were both done by Asian men, um, one in Monterey Park here in the LA, California area. The other one, it was in Half Moon Bay in a mushroom farm. Um, anyway, it, it, it was surprisingly pretty successful. We had a good number of people show up and it went for almost um, like around eight months. And there was a, a man in his 90s uh, come, who found out about it and he got dropped off uh, by, um, you know, someone different each week. Um, and he needed assistance walking and he showed up every week. Um, and he said, you know, I, I fucked up my relationship with my daughter, my wife's mad at me. And um, again, the harm, harm always needs to be, you need to be accountable accountable for it but um i was very in inspired by someone that age so pissed off at himself and continuing to show up and um yeah maybe i think like yeah what is it the revolutionary and maybe in just the everyday practice like um maybe saying those things that might not be so welcome in your revolutionary circle 
but you're questioning it, you know, um, putting that idea out there. Um, I think going and exploring those things that are not so popular, um, to me, like the, the revolution, like, I mean, yeah, kind of that, those principles um, feel, yeah, they're, they're scary, but um, constantly, yeah, I guess exploring in the world and yourself and others and species, et cetera. Um, but yeah, I, I guess, hopefully I'm not going off on a tangent, but the, you know, the elections and voting for Harris or, I, I just feel like that the elections, you know, it, it really kind of, if you were gonna enter the conversation in that way, it, it's such a sometimes so fraught because it becomes in, in one big way, it's such a binary, it puts us against the framework, kind of the structure when you enter like changed conversation of change in that way. Sometimes I feel it can be so limiting. Um, and so, yeah, I don't know. Those are just some of my thoughts um, in kind of exploring that, why art, like human behavior. Um, mm -hmm about why my family member voted for, you know, et cetera. So yeah, I'll stop there. Okay, thanks. Um, yeah. John. So I, I just, just thoughts again. Uh, I think we are taught that it's over because of the leadership that is, is put into place. And it's always either or, you know, it's either this this person or that person, neither one of those people are any good anyways for the country. We know that bad, you know, options and stuff. And that's how they I feel like that's how they want us to feel like now, like, you know, it's over for, you know, my children and my grandchildren. It's, it's just going to be there's no hope for the next generation and stuff. And they want us to think like that because when we start thinking like that, we, we give up. You know, there's a, a piece of us that doesn't see how we could continue to move forward. Like, what can I do now that that's that they're in place? And I, I try to remind myself, it, it, it doesn't matter either or which which one of the you no know, disrespect idiots is put into place. Um, but they're not there to help us. They, they, they're it's a distraction from us being uh, empowered to help ourselves. And that's what we need to, I feel like, remember, you know, is that they can't do what we need. We, they can't do what needs to happen for us. We are the only ones that can do that. And the way that we do that is to continue on doing everything that everyone's talking about on this call and making sure that we're connecting with one another and we don't lose contact and we don't lose this momentum uh, because of, you know, this guy that got elected, we have to remember that they cannot do what we need to be done. We are the ones to do that. We can overcome all of that. It's going to be a period of ugliness. And we know that it's always been a period of ugliness. I, there's really never been a time, you know, where it's it's been great. It's gotten better. You know, we convinced that it's bad, that it's good. But we, we know what we're up against because of the way things turn out. And that's a plus And that's a and that's something that we need to just focus on. I, that Just some thoughts. Thank you. Thank you all so much. I want to quickly announce that we are going to take a short musical break. We are going to come back to ask some more questions. We have some in the queue. I do see some hands up. Um, and I also want to appreciate the, the panelists who are actually typing the replies into the chat. Melinda, I see you answering Rocky's question. You know, that's a way to do that, too, because I know we're going to have such a robust discussion and we do want to try to get to everybody. So, again, musical break. We'll be back in about five minutes for some more questions. OK. For spirits with Miss Katina Rosemond Ray, singer and activist from Raleigh, North Carolina, as she delivers a deeply moving rendition of Make Them Hear You. Go out and tell a story. Let it echo far and wide. Make them hear you. Make 
make them hear you how justice was our battle and how justice was denied make them hear you please make them hear you and say to those who blame us for the way we chose to fight that sometimes there are battles that are more than black or white and I could not put down my sword when just Make them hear you. Ooh. Make them hear you. Go out and tell the story to your daughters and your sons. Make them hear you. Very cool. We're going to come back to our questions. Um, back to the top. I just want to say out loud, I accidentally uh, DM this to somebody else, but Rosemary, we did actually ask one of your questions, so we will get to your hand. If time permits, we want to be able to make space for everybody who has not gotten to go yet. Um, so Adam was the next question that we had. Um, and I thought it was a great question. How do we plan to create structures in the coming period that will receive and integrate people who will be moving from their active movements that are not working to make change that helps them meet their basic needs, right? I mean, that includes like MAGA, Democratic Party, leftist groups that have proven themselves to be more secretarian. Like how do we create the kind of broad and principled organizations and coalitions we need under a fascist state that will be increasingly repressive and violent uh, as, as well as uh, more resourced in its effort at exploiting the existing ideological divisions. So in short, how do we defeat the strategy of the division and achieve the class unity while also protecting and defending our organizations from the intensifying fascist and violent repression? Um. I would, I would love to list off the steps of highly effective organizing conversations because that's what I'm focused on in the next two months. Like, the, you know, Trump cannot actually take action. It's all talk until January 20th. My 
Kansas legislature cannot do anything except for talk and pre-file these bills until the 13th of January. So I have until then to have these conversations, right? And first is establishing, and I'll, I'll type it in the chat here in a minute for you guys, but you have to establish the relationship, whether that's, hi, my name is Melinda and I'm a volunteer talking about housing or whatever, but there's some kind of relationship. And then you listen. You have to listen to people more than you talk and give them that space so that you know what is important to them and what their needs are. And then you educate them with the information you have as, you know, related to their issues. Sometimes we redirect and have to show people how one issue is related to another, right? Because if, if everybody's not free, then nobody's free. Um, and we agitate people around those issues and we inoculate them against misinformation and disinformation. I think that was one of our biggest failures uh, this year um, in a lot of elections is that we didn't talk to enough people and give them enough information to inoculate and protect themselves from misinformation or disinformation. And then we call a question or make an ask, right? Whether that's, hey, I think you're good at talking to people. Will you, you know, join this next meeting or whether, you know, to get people to step into new leadership roles, that kind of thing. That's, that's a kind of ask I'm making of people right now. Um, and then you have to support them through the whole action, whether I'm asking people to go vote no on something, whether I'm asking them to come to a meeting, I have to support them through that whole action until that action is complete. And then we should always debrief. The eighth step is debrief. What went well, what didn't go well, and what do we want to do differently next time? If we take those kind of steps with the people immediately around us, we will build infrastructure organically that is very strong. Wow. Wow. Um, yeah, I'll just, I'll just add, first off, thank you for that list. That's super helpful, and valuable. Um, just kind of just go a little further and, you know, the importance of, you know, establishing a uh, relationship and, and listening to what a person's experience is, you know, it's, it's funny. I, I have, the, I have a, a best friend of mine I've known since I was born and, um, you know, nothing is ever going to get in the way of our relationship, but like, he totally got taken up in the whole Trump, you know, Trump a palooza, whatever you want to call it, like fully, fully bought in. And it's been so challenging to try to, but also interesting at the same time to try to see like, okay, what is it about the rhetoric and like, you know, the positionality that was so attractive to him um, that, or that just spoke to his experience. And he's not like somebody that, uh, you know, he's a, he's, he's working class. Um, you know, he's, he's, uh, you know, he's a, he's a comrade of one of us, but there was something, it, I know what it was. It was really his hatred of the, uh, of, of the, um, of the Democrat party, um, which he saw as just completely ineffective and, and all of this. And, you know, we're seeing that too, but, um, you know, it, it's, um, it's really, <laughs> it, somebody in the chat said coalition building is hard. It really is. You really do have to dig down into, you know, trying to learn who you're, who you're serving, um, you know, and, and really try to understand because everybody's dealing with some, some level of cognitive dissonance. If you live in America, you've been lied to since you were a child. And now you have to deal with that as an adult, once you come into the recognition of that. And that looks so different. I mean, that's, that's like a, it, it's so different for so many people. There's so many buckets of, um, identity that we've been uh, miseducated around. Um, so I think as we start to build with people who are coming into that realization, yes, it's going to hit your emotions. First off, you're going to be reactive. Um, but, uh, you know, and again, kind of where we need to shift our education, you know, is, is in that direction of emotional intelligence. And that will just, that, that is, that affects every relationship that you have, you know, starting with yourself. Um, and as you have start to have these difficult conversations with people that either are just so, so set in their belief system or whatnot, you're not going to be able to convince them any of anything until 
you, their, the information you have or the inf education you have speaks to their experience. So you have to really try to understand what is their experience that makes them feel this way and really develop this, continue to develop your sense of empathy, you know, your sense of patience, um, you know, when, when talking with different people of different backgrounds who, you know, are feeling those strong emotions. I mean, trauma-informed education is, is going to be something that's super crucial for those of us who are, you know, have access to, to certain information, um, you know, to be able to develop the, the grit to, you know, uh, let people process and let people externally process and not fall into that reactionary state yourself when they say something that's just so off the wall that you're like, uh, how could you say that? You know, it's like, we have to really double down on our, on, on, you know, one of the questions that, that I feel is really important right now for all of us is, you know, to ask in the future is what do we still control? You know, what can we control they're, they're, You know, um, cause that's what it's going to come down to. And it starts with yourself. It starts with ourselves. It starts with our emotions. It starts with, you know, being able to not react, but respond. And that takes a process of like, okay, the first voice that is in your head isn't always the one that you speak out loud, right? You, you, you got to be able to separate that from, you know, it's like, a, it's, you know, it's a, it's a, it's a heart mind thing, right? You know, your heart has that passion and wants to shout it, shout, you know, your truth, but then your mind has to be able to look at a larger picture and zoom out and be like, well, what's going to be the most helpful for this, for this particular moment that uh, will allow a person to, to, to hear something else. We finish this up. I'll just add to maybe more confusion um, because this this one's a little difficult for me because thinking back to 2020, you know, like we had all kinds of new folks stepping in, um, new organizations, a lot of youth, like a lot of great energy, um, and and there was a lot of conflict, at least here in San Jose, you know, um, and so very very honestly, like for myself, feeling feeling in this moment a little bit hesitant because of being burned during that time, but also um, wanting to remain open for those folks who are experiencing something and then naturally they want to get involved because they're facing it themselves, you know, because I mean, it's been this long and we're still in here and we have to have a movement like that is full of people who this this is our life right like part of our life not like just a, a job that we're doing or something like that um it's the way that we live our life but that like hesitancy is hella real in me right now of being like oh no like everybody wants to get involved right now or how can i join um and how do i remain open to that possibility like I need help from, I need help from others right there um, because it is a moment where people are gonna be looking for spaces that feel good to them um, when everything is not. Um, and so maybe I just need, I need help to be a, a good safe space <laughs> no matter what, um, so. Mm -hmm. so uh, that's a really great question that was posed. It's one to ponder for a minute. Um, I believe I'm supposed to do something here, but I'm a little confused. Which question am I supposed to be addressing? I can just come in and ask you if you'd like. Huh? I'll just come in with the assist. High five. Um, there was a question in the chat about, can someone share the ways that project 2025, like it's gonna impact us? Like fascism is being applied nationally and locally. Um, so can somebody speak on those? And can somebody on the panel, if they're aware of the recall here in Oakland, being a strategy um, of the billionaires to shut down the working class um, and the importance of a political education helping us build to, build 
to both resist and transform. So it's kind of a two-part question. Can you first talk about the ways that Project 2025 is going to be applied? Um, and then if anybody has some information on the Recall Oakland strategy. Um, I'll tell you about the Midwest. I mean, the private prison industry is super excited. Uh, they're trying to hire a lot of people and expand their facilities. Um, our uh, abortion clinics, Planned Parenthood opened up a new one in Pittsburgh, Kansas. Um, uh, you know, we, we are helping as many people from the South from our, our friends in Oklahoma and Texas and Nebraska and Arkansas. Missouri just got abortion back. They somehow also got minimum wage and a bunch of other cool stuff. Um, so good for them. Um, but then we don't know what's gonna happen at the national level that could usurp some of that, you know, like new minimum wage stuff or, or other new state regulations or rights that that people just won. Um, uh, so, so, you know, Project 2025, it is, um, I agree that it's been going on for a long time. It uh, reminds me of the way that Margaret Atwood wrote The Handmaid's Tale. She didn't make any of that up. She did historical research, looked at the bad things happening to people all over the world in different cultures at different times and places and put it all in one book. That's what Project 2025 feels like to me. Like they look at all the ALEC legislation in Mississippi and Tennessee and Alabama where they arrest and punish the most pregnant people uh, in the nation and stuff like that. They looked at Florida and, and they looked at these fascist things that were working in little bits and pieces all over the country. Um, and in California, I feel like, you know, somebody mentioned the tech industry earlier and how that that is creating all these like non- labor existences um, or you know certain things trying to be replaced with AI, which if you've played with AI, you know how terrifying that is because it's terrible and stupid. Um, not, not as good as a real person. Um, there's gonna be huge environmental uh, impacts. Uh, we, we should anticipate uh, worse storms and things like that. So people are preparing for natural disasters um, being more intense. Uh, as we look at uh, continued global climate change and also how that impacts our ability to grow food, um, which California also grows a lot of food. Um, but I'd love to hear more about the Oakland and how that recall uh, imp impacted everything. Um, I just I, I would like to say about the, the recall what what I do know what I, what I feel like I understand from conversations. You know, we 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 had some uh, progressives, you know, supposedly in our office, uh, Pamela Price and Shang Tao. And of course, the billionaire boys clubs didn't want those type of people in office, along with uh, Carol Fife. But looking at it now, because of uh, the the recall and uh, Shang Tao getting recalled, there's an opportunity for somebody even more experienced in someone that could probably uh, bring a little, uh, uh, um, I don't know, balance to Oakland and maybe to the Bay Area. And that's uh, Barbara Lee has been approached uh, about possibly running for uh, mayor uh, when they do the elections. And, and, and we all know that uh, she is, she's on our side. So, and, and I don't know if people know about, and this is how we know if they're scared that they might've made a mistake by actually recalling a uh, tower, putting her up for that recall, it might be it might backfire in their face because you know we have uh, uh, Carol Fife still in office, and I don't know if people know, and I just want to say this that you know someone tried to burn her house down a couple days ago, and that just shows the desperation of uh, uh, you know the billionaire boys club, the other side, you know they're they're scared. Because now they're looking at it as like we they might get Barbara Lee into 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 that position, which they didn't want that. They wanted like Lauren Taylor or some others that were just going to cause more mayhem within our city. But I, I'm trying to look at the positive that came out of it, and we should too to really think. Okay, well, Shang Tao, you know, didn't really get an opportunity to, to show us anything, and from day one she was under scrutiny, and she made us some promises, you know, she shouldn't have made, but. 
Now we have an opportunity, honestly, to put somebody even better into office. And that's how I look at the recalls. If they made a mistake uh, and getting and, and, and they're going to pay for that mistake. You know, and I, I'm 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 on that positive trip. Uh, you know, it's, it's going to turn out a little bit better for us because we'll have somebody more experienced and 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 dedicated to the fight and has been in it for the last thirty years. So thank you. And just the thought that popped into my head off of that is, you know, the more that we can have candidates lined up. You know, if, you know, so it's like, just like that, it's like you cut off one head and another one is going to come back stronger, you know, but on the positive uh, tip, you know, that, that that's the type of organizing that we need to be empowering our young people with and, and each other and everything. It's like, if we, we have the numbers, you know, if we have the people that are willing to step up because we already know that the powers that be will do anything to try to, they'll resort to assassination if they you know if they if they're scared and, and they are so we have to anticipate that and not let not it has to be a movement of a mass movement not just a, a one person that's you know that's doing the fight it's all of us and you know if we have those numbers and that and and that army they you know that's i think that's what's going to take okay um ethel did you have a comment you wanted to make on the recall? Sure. No, John started, uh, John and, and yes. certainly Melinda did a great job in talking about the big picture. I think John's comments as a fighter here in our area covered some of the other aspects. I can't say enough about what um, Rahman just raised about a part of our solution, along with the outline that Melinda gave is building a broad movement. But Liz, whom I love so much, all of you, all of you here, you're speaking to how do we rebuild a transformative liberation movement? And I think the honesty that you just shared, Liz, that you know we're gonna have to rebuild relationships that really proceed from the values that people are talking about here. We can't take as an assumption that everyone sees there's a value to building unity for what we need. And so we, and we've got to be learning lessons. Um, Danny raised, well, I have a view of revolutionaries in one kind of romanticized view, but aren't all of us that are fighting to save the planet and a future for the next seven generations, aren't we revolutionaries too? We may not look like Mr. Che Guevara. We, our ideas may not be as developed as his were, but we are in a revolutionary period in history. So in our city, we're only 400,000, but the billionaires determined, like John was saying, that there was too much progressive policy on securing housing as a human right. So the point of the recall was to essentially um, dis allow our effort, the public's effort of securing the people that we wanted and the policy that we wanted. It, it was another way of suppressing our voice and our vote. And so though I agree with you, John, that you know we could press forward and have a much better contender, we still need to recognize these uh, uh, strategies to essentially uh, eviscerate the electoral process. That's really what the MAGA crowd and Project 2025 is one aspect because they don't have a solution. People have said it all throughout the morning. The, cap, um, the capitalists, the billionaires, the corporations, they don't have a solution to how to feed, clothe, house, and protect the planet for 8 billion human beings. We've got those. We've got the incentive for that. So what we're seeing is locally, billionaires are trying to take over our government. And we have to be um, ready for that. You know, it's like, why do they even need, they've always run it. Let's, let's, let's be clear, like uh, Melinda was saying, this is not, in some ways it's not new things, but the thing that is new is their willingness to just completely put into the can any pretense of democracy for anyone. And how do we, I think the other lesson is how do we combine both the class fight and the identity fight, not allow them to pit the battles for equality 
versus the battles to live. And that's what we, we, we were gonna, we're gonna encounter that. Mr. Park there in LA Skid Row, Hip Hop Congress with what you're doing, you're encountering that now. How do we hold our networks like this together and I'd say political education, John, that work that you guys are doing where you're doing the on the ground work and you're doing the political education work. It's not magic. It is absolutely the kind of dedicated work that we need to ensure it. So those are my thoughts. There's a lot more that you can read in the um, rally uh, on the recall. And there are deep lessons that we wanna make sure we share um, as we go forward. Uh, Barbara Lee is a prospective candidate for mayor, but um, Carol Fife might also be a prospective candidate for mayor. And we know that in both of them, we have tried and true leaders who fight for the people. And that's a part of what we need in every step along the way in this work. Thank you, Ethel. Um, I see some hands up, we'll go there. And then we have one final question that we're going to ask the panel. Um, first we'll go to Lisa and then we'll go to Yolanda. Okay, thank you very much. Um, my name's Lisa Nice. I'm a member of uh, CID UNESCO. I'm also the global outreach director and a founding member of Unity Net International, um, which has been uh, taken 20 years to formulate a plan uh, to create a more agrarian society. Um, as part of the UN Global Compact. Um, currently, we're in 21 nations. We're speaking with another 30 uh, to get them involved, as well as worldwide organizations that are dedicated to this process. Um, I wanted to address what Melinda said earlier about Project 2025. For those of you who do any independent study, if you take a look at Hungary, especially the takeover of the nation by the Fidesz party, you'll find that they've been following a plan that is a carbon copy of what Project 2025 is all about. That plan was brought to them. They've been in power for 27 years. And the person who helped them with this plan is none other than Vladimir Putin himself. Um, it is part of his plan to depopulate the planet by a minimum of 5 billion. Um, the World Health Organization's declaration in 2023 of there being over 8 billion people on the planet is inaccurate. That's based on the census that all nations have every 10 years, as there are groups that nations do not recognize. That means no nation did an accurate count. The approximate estimate that the UN has is that that number is closer to 10 billion, not 8 billion. And that's because of migrants, refugees, and those who are forced from their homes for whatever purposes. Um, I wanted to be able to pull that information up uh, for information on Hungary. You can go straight to the internet or you can try to contact um, any member of the resistance that is large there. I've got several contacts within. I will let you know how Hungary secured their borders. Wasn't with a wall with an electric fence that surrounds the nation. So that was information I wanted to impart. If anybody wants uh, to ask me any more questions on that, you can reach me through Rahman Jamal here because uh, I'm also the foreign liaison and advisor for the Hip Hop Congress. An effort to preserve hip hop culture from the ravages of the plans by the Russian Federation to destroy cultures by taking their dances away from them. I've been watching that for 27 years. It wasn't an attempt to get the breaking into the Olympics. I was actually the official they told that to. I told them they were committing genocide and advised against it. They didn't listen. Thank you and for sharing. Course, the, I appreciate that very, very much, Mac. All right, moving it forward back to the rest. 
uh, we'll go to Yolanda. And then, like I said, we have time for uh, one final question that we have for our panelists after that. Um, go ahead, Yolanda. Yeah, my, uh, a couple of things. My question is, um, I have a, my, my daughter's boyfriend, his manager, and I'm worried they no longer pay, and they no longer charge rent. They, they go to the house, second house. But um, to ask my question, this manager is that being exploited. But I'd like to take this opportunity to also say that I'm registered green and we do advocate and we do endorse Democratic candidates, Democratic Party candidates. I volunteer to uh, campaign for Aaron Peskin for uh, mayor, uh, when they asked me to call the, the Democrats that speak Spanish, um, the voters, I did, and I read the script which said that they were against, that Aaron Peskin is against gentrification and against deportation. And when I would read out to the, the people, the, the, the people I was calling, they, they said, yes, I will for him. So know your community. Uh, like I say, know your community. The other thing I would like to say is that I did go for uh, Harris, even though I, I get past the picture for um, Jill Stein, because I agree with the People's Tribune and the League of Revolution Rights for New America. It was like similar to when Stalin said he would make peace with um, Hitler so they could, so Soviet Union could prepare the military um, uh, structure. So I think that, that was a very wise choice because. Um, we were fighting for democracy and and and, and I, I was in political solidarity announcement for Palestine and a Zoom, and they said that some of the democratic pe people that were elected were for programs like annexing the West Bank and Palestine, and some of those people that voted for them, they now vote for Harris. I believed her choice of wars was not the right choice. I know a lot of Latino men and black men that are not included in our vote for her. I, I'm not against it any longer. Um, Palestine does it. That's how they built the tunnel spiders. That's why I, I love and I appreciate the Middle Eastern people. They have a lot to bring in, although they bring in a lot of money and, and they are part of the gentrification, but they're willing to listen. So we got to make really, you know, stop all the stereotypes about gentrification. There's a lot of Asians that, are, that, are, that have money to come here and, and we can work with them. They're very good people. They, they have a lot of good ideas are very, 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 very good ideas um, for the health and nutrition. So that's that's my two cents worth. And thank you to the people's community and the legal revolutionaries for America for leading us and I've heard democracy and I am glad I did volunteer with the Democrats and um and I am still registered with the Green Party. So thank you. And if somebody could answer my question, does um being a manager does that mean that that's Thank you. Uh, you what? I can't. I can't hear anymore. Thank you, Yolanda. Um, Yolanda. Yeah. I'd love to address your question. This actually came up in one of our conversations for uh, 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 Hip Hop Congress meets at this at this time actually on Clubhouse every week. We've been doing it for uh, two years. Right, we're on episode like 140 something, but uh, 142. I think this is the one, but. Um, but we we meet every every weekend um, to just have these types of discussions. Um, but one of the things that came up to your question, Yolanda, was you know people that are in service positions. Um, you know, oftentimes you know we we have um, we have a brother uh, by the name of Marquez uh, who um, you know is battling homelessness and and trying to deal with the 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 the. the um, the uh, structure that is meant to, you know, the departments that are meant to deal with that. And his, we asked him, you know, what was, what, what would be the, what's the thing that was, you know, your greatest need? And it was, you know, he's like, people don't see us as human, you know, whether it's, you know, darker skin or, or whatever, like, or poor, or there's this lack of, you know, really the humanity. And, um, and then we have brothers like uh, DeFranco who are on this call right now, you know, who work in, um, you know, reentry programs and things like that. Um, you know, there's people that uh, are in law enforcement. And, you know, to your question, is a, is a person in a management position an exploiter really has to do with, um, do they hold people accountable to the humanity of their role in serving others? Um, a lot of people are just there in their job trying to make money. Um, exactly. Um, you know, and, and they're not thinking 
know, they're thinking of a paycheck. It's just their job. This is what, what they fell into. And so when they're dealing with human beings, you know, they're not, they're not really putting themselves in the shoes or really speaking to them in that way. Um, and if, a, and if a, somebody in a management position or even just a coworker, you know, doesn't hold them accountable, like if we're not holding each other accountable in our positions or whatever we do to, 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 to be more human, you know, then yes, you put yourself in that position to, to, you know, be an exploiter, um, you know, even, and, and it's not even, not even intentionally, it doesn't have to be like, I'm an intentional thing. Um, you know, it's just that, that, that lack of empathy of really, you know, understanding, like when you are serving, when you're in a service position, whether it's to serve and protect or whether it's to, you know, serve someone with needs, you're, you're in that role, you have to, it's more than just a transactional, you know, it's, it's a relationship and it, and it, and that it comes back down to that. So I think anybody in a manager management position that works with employees, works with other people just has to really focus on supporting the relationships of everybody in their uh, company and unit. And then you don't have to, you know, worry on whether you're exploiting people or not. Thank you. Well, well said. <laughs> Thank you. Um, you know, we're getting short on time, but we have this critical question in front of us and, and hopefully can get addressed. Uh, uh, and then if people want to stay after, you can stay after. But, but a question that's come up that, that we feel is critical is millions of Americans showed that they are dissatisfied with the two-party system. How does a viable third party actually get built? Any responses to that juggernaut? <laughs> of course, we've addressed, uh, all of you have addressed a lot on organizing, you know, and, uh, and points on organizing. But this third party thing is something that uh, hasn't been able to get off the ground and of course purposefully so I think if we look around you know the laws and the the way the duopolies have have uh, schemed in a million ways so it doesn't get off the ground but I have a I have a question uh, to yeah. answer your question I don't know the process in the state of California I know the process to file another political party in the state of Kansas is you have to collect the number of signatures that is a percentage of the number of people that voted in the last governor's election. Um, and uh, then those signatures get certified and boom you are a political party that is recognized in that state. Um, but every state is probably going to have a slightly different process, and so if we want to think about nationwide that is. That is just a network of these, um, you know, state to state uh, places that a party, a political party, a five two seven organization, um, gets gets recognized, and um, it's not complicated. Where I live, it's not even expensive. Um, but the question is, how do you build all that party infrastructure? DSA said a couple of years ago that it would take five years and over $2 million to just build a voter database that would be comparable to what the Democrats have right now. I mean, some people have like quantified this, right? Like they have an estimate of how much it would cost uh, to build like voter database, fundraising platforms, et cetera. Like the technological tools that you need to operate a political party um, is, uh, extensive, um, extensive and expensive. Um, so, you know, those are, those are some of the things, um, that I think about facing when I think about a different party. Can I, can I just say one thing too? Uh, that's, that's, I, I, I love that. Cause I, when you, you asked the question, I was like, oh my God, how do you do that? But and that's the, the answer was very the, the, 
the technical answer to that, but how you do it also is to show people that there is another way. We've been programmed to think that it's only, you know, Dems and Republicans, and there's one way to exist on this planet, and that's with capitalism. Capitalism, And so when we have to show people that there could be another type of economy that's based off of basically sharing resources, you know, so what people don't know is that there, there could be another way created to live. And, and I think these, uh, the example is there, and that's why they just keep dismantling like Camp Resolution in Sacramento with three commons. You know, they don't promote homefulness in East Oakland. Any, uh, any encampment or, or small community that's living outside of the way that they uh, tell you is the only way that you can live. And that's what they're scared of because we are showing people that there's another way and there could be a third party. And I think if we continue what we're doing right now, basically, and keep showing and educating and and and, and, and networking and, you know, sharing these resources and, and more, that will build and build and build. Don't know when, you know, but that's the, I think that's one of the ways that we do that. Thank you. Great. Great. We're just getting out of time here, you know, uh, and it's, it's so good. It's so fruitful. Um, um, Kimberly. Um, has a, a bit of a sum up, uh, better you than me. This is a lot to sum up, um, but go for it, Kimberly. Okay, I'll just say a few words. Um, we only have a couple minutes, I'm so sorry, in the whole program. Um, so I'm just really gonna talk fast and not say that much, but I really welcome, thank you everybody for being here today. Um, the best way to fight against the billionaires efforts to take over our cities, the best way to oppose Trump and to defeat fascism is to keep doing what the panelists and others have said today, to step up our organizing work, to come together, build relationships and fight for the things we need to fight together for our children's future. Uh, Jeannie talked about how we're all part of a class that's barely surviving and that needs a new society. John talked about what that new society could be. Um, the League of Revolutionaries for a New America invites you to join us, to meet with us, to collaborate with us, uh, to improve the situation in our communities, get what our communities need locally, and for the future that our children deserve. Our mission is to unite with others based on the needs of the people and to work forward to that cooperative society where the social wealth of society is owned in common and distributed not according to who has the most uh, money, but according to need. And that uh, we're trying to emphasize um, the unity of all the people that are fighting for a new society. Um, really, we see that these fights for housing, education, healthcare, really are a fight for a new society. We're not gonna get that under a capitalist system. We have to fight forward for a different society. And the best way to do that is to fight for the basic needs that we have right now. Um, we can have that society. There's way more of people in our class than the few billionaires that are running it now. So um, again, we invite you to join us and we look forward to working with you more in the future. Thanks. Thanks, Kimberly. And then of, and then of course, we would like to thank you all for attending and participating in this dialogue with our featured participants from Kansas all the way to California. We wanna again, thank you to our panelists and also to our tech team. This stuff goes on, right? We never get to talk about the invisible labor that even puts these kinds of things on. Um, so we wanna shout out to our tech team and all of the League of Revolutionary and Hip Congress for putting this program together. Uh, please look at the website learna.org that's l-r-n-a.org for listings of other upcoming events sponsored by the league of revolutionaries for new america they are always putting on these national dialogues and when we talk about the ways to move forward and to build unity um it's by talking to each other it's by learning from each other what's happening on the ground um and getting together and engaging in ways that allow for us to come up with those solutions together uh you are more than welcome to stay on the line uh, some people may stay on and have a bit of more of an informal discussion about the dialogue and next steps. Nobody is required to stay. I myself have to go, but I am excited to see y'all next time. Thank you one more time for attending and participating. Have a beautiful day.
Thank you very much. And I, my name is Estella Gonzalez, and um, I'd like to thank Sandy Perry for inviting me in this. This is my first time that I have joined any um, type of group, and I appreciate what everyone is doing. Thank you. Thank, thank, you. thank you for and, coming. Uh, Raman from Hip Hop Congress, would you like to say anything else? We, we really appreciate the co-sponsorship of the Hip Hop Congress. Right. Yeah. Yes, thank you. Um, you know, Ethel and I go way back. Um, you know, our networks are have always um, uh, worked together um, for just the mutual political education and artistic inspiration. Um, there was one point that um, that I didn't get to make that um, you know it's, it's kind of like a, a rabbit hole, if you will. But um, just to put it out there, uh, you know, we're we're using tech right now to you know network and, and come together. And the role of technology is going to be really also crucial for us to look at because it's going to be leveraged, obviously, you know, by the people in power. We need to be able to do the same thing and leverage technology for our needs. And that requires, work, you know, um, working with the generation that's already using this tech and, and understanding it. But the AI technology is moving so fast that it's easy to get overwhelmed and think, oh God, it's gonna take over. But we can't forget that AI relies on our input to do its job. If it's only getting input from the, the, the powers that be, well, it's gonna be a tool for them. But if it gets input from us, if it gets input from the people who need the most support, then it can learn what our needs are just as easily. But we have to, we have to utilize it and see it as a tool as such for that as well. Um, so. I would, I would, I would, I would just, you know, don't shut the door, don't shut that door because um, it is like any type of technology is, is a tool that can be weaponized, but it can be weaponized on both sides. Um, and, you know, it's, it's just one of those things that it's not going to go away. So we have to really uh, learn how to make it serve us, um, you know, in this, in, in, in the future. I just wanted to make that point. Um, and, you know, like I said, it's on ongoing conversation, but we uh, we continue conversations as Hip Hop Congress, like I said, on Clubhouse. Um, I don't know if anybody is um, who's on that uh, call can share the link in the chat. Um, but Clubhouse, speaking of tech, is an app that's basically like a uh, community podcasting um, app where you can um, chime in and listen or you can be brought up to the stage and add your two cents. Um, it's not visual though, so it's different than Zoom. It's only audio, but we record that audio as a reference point as well. So if anybody wants to stay engaged in these uh, in these big topics, um, that is a weekly resource on Saturdays at 12 noon on the West Coast, um, and then in your respective time zones wherever you're at. Um, and we would love to invite everybody on this call um, to come in and, and participate in those and, and, and we continue to build because consistency is, is the key as well. Thank you. Gotta get in the game. You gotta learn how to play. You gotta make a change. You gotta do it today. You better learn how to fight. You better say it out loud.